Cole, my first question is, is kind of a personal one. Um, when and how did you first encounter Ulysses and how has your reading of Ulysses changed over the years? Um, I, I think like a lot of people, I read sections of it. Um, Molly Bloom's soliloquy, Cyclops, um, Sirens, you know, various episodes that seemed uh, almost could stand alone. That if you knew the general context, you could go to those chapters. Um, other chapters were very difficult. Um, Oxen of the Sun, for example, or, or or even the third the third episode, you know, where Stevens on the beach at that. Um, so that so that it, it was that, that was the first reading. And the second reading where I did force myself to read the book from beginning to end um, over a sort of Christmas season. Um, but in recent years, I have come to sort of study the thing in the same way as other people might study horses or, you know, or the ballet or something you know, and get to know about famous dancers. And I have become very interested in, the, in some of the critical commentary on the book. So um, the last few years have been really enriched by the book, I have to say. And so how, how um, has your relationship changed since that first reading? I mean, or I suppose maybe let's start with, as you've been writing about it, as you've been teaching it, how, how do you now relate to it in a way that's possibly different the first um, time? Oh, it's, um, it's really ingenious. And it's, um, I mean, some people love saying, well, it's such a funny book, but it is only sometimes funny. Other times it, it is really uh, an exploration of style, of what can happen to prose under certain pressures. But it also is a book about Ireland. Mm. And that I think has been in, in, the, in the same way as Henry James and Thomas Mann have been, I suppose, be envisioned in the last 30 years. Um, I, mean, I mean, especially with James's sexuality, with Thomas Mann's politics, also his sexuality. But in the case of, uh, in the case of James Joyce, his politics, mm. where, where exactly he stood as though indeed he were a tree, you know, and it had roots on questions to do with, you know, Irish nationalism, about socialism, about um, the empire. Um, so that, that, that they have been the burning questions. So there have been, it has been a sort of faction fight to some extent over um, some people claiming that he was a, really all along a sort of nationalist and other mm -hmm. people claiming that it's the style that matters. Stop talking about him as though he were a pamphleteer. Well, surely it's both. Um, oh, oh, yes, it's both, but, but there are moments when you feel that the people who are interested in, say, say queering him mm. and post-colonializing him, that you wish they would stop for just a moment and just look at some, at some stylistic. It is almost sometimes a flight from reading the book is to start analyzing its, mm. its, its, its politics as a way of not allowing what was really happening in the book to actually flow over you mm. yeah. to, to work on you yeah perhaps yeah. Yeah. um you mentioned uh that you're you, you the second time you read it you you had to force yourself to read it and this goes to my second question which is that um you wrote of the book uh, that to be an ordinary man in a city on an ordinary day is i quote fully in the spirit of ulysses and yet if an ordinary man or indeed woman in a city on an ordinary day were to pick up a copy of Ulysses, they would have a tough time of it, which is to say, um, how do we reconcile on the one hand, this book is open, inclusive, this is the great cultural leveler. So this is the book that in the same paragraph manages to fit in Adam and Eve, Arthur Wellesley, Michelangelo, the Queen of Sheba and Shane O'Neill. This is the book that was censored, I think it's brilliant, censored uh, in, the, in the 20s and 30s for its frank and forthright descriptions of bowel movements, masturbation, and menstruation. So we have this kind of um, uh, openness, inclusivity, baseness on the one hand. On the other hand, this is, as you say, for, for the average reader, a largely impenetrable text, both in terms of form, you mentioned Oxen of the Sun, famously one of the most difficult episodes, and in terms of content, Joyce, you write, Colm makes no allowance for the reader as outsider. How do you reconcile these two strands? Oh, um, 
that it, it brings you in very easily, the book. In other words, the first two episodes um, really are, you know, the episode where Steve, Stephen Dedalus wakes in the morning, he's, he's, he's staying in this tower with people who are his frenemies. And it's, it's an, you know, anyone has ever been a student, anyone has ever lodged with others, it can actually see the tensions going on between them. It has um, some very good ironies in that opening where the Englishman just can't get used to the way the two Irishmen are talking. He feels there's something behind it. And eventually he says about history, you know, it's, it's about England and Ireland and the 700 years business. He said, it, you know, it seems history is to blame. And you can just feel Joyce. It's one of the very few times in the book when anyone English gets to speak in the book. And this Joyce just gives him a line, which just for the Irish people, that is just such an ironic. I mean, so, yes, history, that's what's to blame. And, uh, you know, and in the second episode, you know, we see Mr. DC, um, who's the school, you know, the schoolmaster. And we, we hear his anti-Semitism, his general prejudices. And we watch Stephen being very kind to a student who isn't great. And we probably watch more than anything. We don't, we stop watching, we start listening because the noises, the noise of the, for example, the, the school kids just playing football, just that noise comes in to Stephen because of course, and we, we learn things about Stephen later. Joyce is great sometimes at, you know, he says, what should a novelist tell you? Well, everything you need to know about the character as soon as possible. No, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to tell you, you've got to find out much later. Stephen hasn't washed yes. for very, since the previous October, <laughs> and this is June, and that he really hasn't eaten for quite some time either, so that he's starving and he's filthy, and also his, his mind is filled with what his better as might call nonsense because he's done an arts degree which as you know and i know is an awful mistake because you come out the other side knowing all the wrong things you know you don't you're not an engineer you find yourself presenting to an audience at yeah. the american library in paris yes, on a Friday exactly. evening. <laughs> and so 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 in the third episode we have that every single thing stephen sees he he has a veil of learning around it he's read aristotle and he can't stop himself it's not just boasting he's boasting to himself which is much worse than boasting to others others you know the, so the third episode is so filled with his learning um, that 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 becomes an impediment mm -hmm. to your reading it until you realize no no this this is this is a young man who has read all these books and he's seeing the world you know with the with those colors mm -hmm. and you start watching that and of course if then you start you you you, you have a good guide to say oh right the, the he in this is in fact Aristotle Joyce just doesn't want to name him because it might seem just too loaded. But if you follow, just start following him. And part of the reason for, for episode three is that episode four is coming. And you feel the author knows this, that after this episode, I have a surprise. I'm going to give you an ordinary man on an ordinary day. And I'm going to give you a, a mind that isn't um, tainted by learning. Uh, it's completely engaged with the with with the visible world. That the way that Stephen is so maimed by his bookishness, Bloom is actually alive and alert and watching and in the world. And so you then have these two sensibilities operating right. um, in the pages of the book. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm saying that the book that to say it's impenetrable, to say it's even a difficult read, is 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 probably untrue. In, in other words, that that once you become open, I think to its design, and you start watching Joyce writing it, you think, what's he, how is he going to get out of this one? And you realize what, what he's doing is he's, it, that it's scorched field. In other words, yeah. each time he writes it, he, he uses a certain style or adapts a certain tone, you, you realize he's going to do everything possible with it until by the time he's finished it, he won't go back to that style again. So, so that even though we talk about stream of consciousness, it's not exactly stream of consciousness when Bloom is moving in the city. It's just it, attempting to find how his mind darts in little sentences. And, but, but eventually, actually, Joyce more or less gives this up. I mean, he's done enough of it. He's got other fish to fry stylistically. But actually, Bloom's mind is tremendously rich. And I think that idea of it not being tainted by learning it means that the, uh, there's a wonderful moment where he's passing, he's passing a church on Westland Row. It's still there, the church. It always will be. It's just empty now. And mass is being said, and Bloom starts to think about mass. And his and mind... He's, he's a Jew. What? We, we have, we have he, for anyone who hasn't read it, Bloom is Jewish. Oh, Bloom is Jewish. Right. And um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, Bloom, Bloom is Jewish. 
And um, he also, does, no matter what he sees, he speculates. So that he's always he's interested in social improvement. He thinks should, things should be better. He likes machines. He he's makes his money from advertising. So he's a modern man in that sort of way. And um, anyway, he sees um, mass being said. And he starts to muse on mass, and he thinks, yes. It, it, oh, oh, just about a page previously, he's seen an ad for ginger ale. So ginger ale is sort of on his mind slightly, and um, he thinks wine is a very dignified drink and it's good that they use bread and wine dignified things to change into the body and blood and then he suddenly thinks mm, it wouldn't be the same if it were ginger ale and you just think what you know this it's, i mean it's a really wonderful moment and the, the, you know as he moves up the street he's, he's always thinking about sex he's always sort of looking at women and he does all that and then he ends up um he has to buy soap for his wife no he has to buy a prescription he has to get medicine for his wife but he buys her a bar of soap and that bar of soap becomes then for the rest of the novel where is the bar of soap because sometimes you can see joyce remembering at the end of an episode oh my god he has a bar of soap in his pocket so you know he becomes a sort of realist novelist certain funny moments in the book where where is the bar of soap i better put it in here and then there's an episode where the, it's as though the bar of soap he's forgotten the bar of soap and um he um in, in, if there's a plot in the book, the plot could be that this is the day of the Ascot Gold Cup. And the, the people of USA's are chancers. There are people who are down on their luck. They would love to win money on a horse. And Bloom knows nothing about horses. He's just, he isn't a drinker. He doesn't bet on horses. He's got other things on his mind. But unfortunately, there's a horse running a 20 to 1 called Throwaway. This horse will win. Bloom doesn't know anything about this, except that he meets a man who's going to bet money on the race and he gives him a newspaper said i'm going to throw this away i'm throwing it away and the man presumes this is a this is a tip for the horse throw away and later on in the book they will presume everybody that bloom has won all this money and uh and that um he um is too mean to buy a drink you know which is another anti-semitic trope in the book mm -hmm. so you, you know the whole day then is uh, references so many wonderful and what happens with the book is you start um, getting engaged loving noticing the soap throw away scepter who's the horse who's the favorite doesn't win blazes boylan who yes. has to be mentioned here is yes. having a thing with with um bloom's wife molly and the connection between all these people is singing in other words molly is a singer um blazes boylan is our sort of manager and uh he's going to visit her at four o'clock so the, the, the novel centers also around this idea, almost unmentionable, but in Bloom's mind enough for you to realize this is all he's thinking about. Mm -hmm. But you watch him trying to think about other things because Blazes is going to visit his wife at four o'clock. And Blazes, of course, has his money on Scepter. Later on, they'll find a little piece of paper. You know, Blazes put quite a lot of money on Scepter. So all day, this business of the city teeming with people who, who are thinking about the race. Mm -hmm. So. The reader becomes engaged because the reader loves noticing mentions of scepter, other things about throwaway, other things about the race, other things about the soap, other things about Blazes Boylan. So the attentive reader, the more attentive you are, the more pleasure you will get from being in, in on the joke, in on the game. So it becomes an insider, insiderish experience reading it that you somehow have, have it's, it's not that you're following the plot, you're following the references. Right. And, and um, OK, so you mentioned Aristotle and you and you said you kind of laughed when you said if there's a plot, perhaps perhaps there isn't. It's true that there are many kind of background things one might need to know to enter into the book so that there's discussions of religion, philosophy, science, psychology, economics, history, politics, literary references. I mean, one might have to have read The Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, you mentioned music, knowing about the kind of technicalities of music, certainly the songs that one was singing at the time of the early 20th century, even Joyce's own biography, his relationship with his father, given um, the constraints of time, Colm, what, <laughs> what information for you is, is really essential background information to know going into this? Um, I think you need to know the Odyssey and you need to know that um, it, in, in, as Joyce was working, um, 
the every young writer was thinking about Irish mythology. Mm -hmm. They were translating texts from the ancient Irish. To go to a Greek ancient text was a political act, was an act of non serviam, was an act of saying, I will not join the Irish literary renaissance. I will not follow Yeats. I will not follow Lady Gregory. I will go to a European model. I will look outwards from insularity. So, so it isn't merely that, he, and of course, what happens sometimes with the Odyssey is he doesn't follow it. You can see him, you can actually almost imagine him looking at an episode thinking, is there anything I can get from the Odyssey for this episode? And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's, it's not doing something. Like what? Um, well, 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 that you know, that, that Penelope, for example, stays at home weaving. Right. I, mean, I mean, she doesn't actually have an affair with anybody. And to think, well, you know, how do how do you have such a woman based on Penelope? What is her what form does her weaving take? Yeah. And so that's an example of one where he goes the opposite direction. He doesn't have Bloom's wife at home patiently waiting for him, using strategies to keep you know lovers at bay. Uh, with, in the case of Molly, she keeps strategies to you know to to remind herself about you know how much fun she has, mm -hmm. um, is, uh, you know, uh, as a sexual being. So I mean that would be one example um the the other thing is is the random business that in other words it seems like a novel that is so designed in other words its episodes are have titles that are based on titles of episodes in the odyssey he there there are a number of schema in other words he gave uh, he, he did even a drawing of how the novel could relate to the body he did other drawing he did other sh showing how you know each episode was had a color a part of the body you know there's, a, there's an immense amount of scheming or strategizing of, of you know architecture mm -hmm. choreography mm -hmm. but you can then watch his mind wandering as he's writing I want to give you, you mentioned that list with all those people in it, mm -hmm. but there's a list, I mean, he is sometimes just entirely mischievous, he's entirely boyish, he just wants to cause as much trouble as possible, yeah. and in 1904, all he has to do is imagine that it's a, it's a year away from the centenary of the execution of Robert Emmett. The, Robert Emmett is, is really held as, 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 uh, with great reverence. You know, Thomas Moore has written songs about him. Barely Oz wrote a song. He was so moved by the execution of Robert Emmett. So it's, 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 it's 100 years later, it's, he's one of the icons of Irish nationalism that is depending on martyrology for, for part of its um, impulse. And um, Joyce decides that this would be a marvelous thing to mock. And um, so he decides to have a sort of mock execution of Robert Emmett as reported by someone in the society pages of a newspaper announcing who was there, the ladies, where, you know, what the ladies were wearing, what it, you know, who, and he gives a, starts a big list and you can just see him. It's got nothing to do with any plan, any scheme. It's got to do with the, the delighted mind of going, he suddenly, he offends everybody. He has a character called Bakshish. He has an uh, he has a um, Harry Kari as the Japanese character, but but you know he puts it's a big long list of names. Some of the names are ridiculous. Some of them are just funny. Some of them are outrageous. But in but as the book was going to press, in other words, he had Joyce had a very intense last six months of 1921 when he was adding the final episodes, but he was getting so much energy from that mm -hmm. that he started to go back to earlier episodes and rewrite them. Mm -hmm. And he was rewriting all over the proofs. Mm -hmm. And the printers in Dijon, were uh, only one of whom spoke English. The, the one who spoke English caused more trouble than the, the French just tried to follow his handwriting as he wrote all over the proofs. He'd get more proofs back, he'd write all over them again. Eventually they said to me, you have to stop. If you want this book on your 40th birthday, as you do, 2nd of February, you have to stop doing this. And so he woke in the middle of the night, or at least in my imagination he did. And he realized that in that big long list of names, I mean, which makes no sense. It's not part of any scheme. It's just fun. And some people mightn't even get the joke. He decided he would like to add Boris Hoopinkoff B-O-R-U-S, hoping cough, K-O-F-F. -F. And obviously he thought this was tremendous funny. He was one of those guys who liked silly jokes about silly names, Boris Whooping Cough. And the, and the printer said, just he telegrammed, in between this and this, can you put Boris Whooping Cough? And they wrote back and said, trop tard, you know, that it's too late, your book is gone. And so this figure, Boris Whooping Cough, wandered the earth 
unprinted, his name never known to humankind until um, Hans Walter Gabler, who was doing the Hans Walter Gabler, who was doing the edition in the 1980s, decided he would put it in. So if you go to the, to the current vintage edition, I think it's on page 242 or 244, but it's back in. Boris got back into the book. But I'm raising this as an example of the sort of randomness with which the actual um, paragraphs were written versus the scheme right. with which the book was, was actually conceived. Right, right. Let's also, call me. you mentioned these two kind of um, times. So you mentioned the time in which he was writing it um, so the book's final words are Trieste, Zurich, Paris, the, th the three cities that he wrote it in, 1914 to 1921. You write, these seven years include years of European conflagration, as well as the 1916 rebellion in Ireland. Ulysses, you add, is not a diary of these years. Its chapters are not ways of responding to public events. Yet, as Edna Duffy, you cite, has written by setting his book, in a relatively uneventful earlier year, so 1904, while writing it amid violent revolutionary and transformative time, Ulysses can know the future without admitting to such knowledge. Talk about this lapse of time and how that's important. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it is fascinating how, um, first of all, how much he got from the city of Trieste in the making of the book. In, in other words, it was the second city um, it was the main port of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it was the second city of the north of Italy, and many languages were spoken in it. And um, there were also, of course, because he was an English teacher, he had access to many houses, including the houses of Jewish people. So, so there, there is a way in which Dublin gets mapped onto Trieste. And, um, but as he's writing the book, obviously Trieste becomes a dangerous place for him to be as a British citizen. He's a, he always is a British passport holder. And so as a British citizen, he's in danger in Trieste of being interned for the duration of the war, which he would not have enjoyed. His brother was interned, his brother Stanislaus, who came to join him, was interned. And so he manages to get to Zurich using friends. It's, it's a very difficult journey. And Ulysses depends on the success of this journey. And he has material with him that he shouldn't have, um, I mean, politically. So he gets to Zurich. And um, of course, what's happening in Dublin then begins to preoccupy him because the very center of the city, which he is describing so meticulously, is being bombed. And you know the photographs coming from it are of a city being raised, whose you know central street is being raised to the ground. And it, it's hard not to feel that Ulysses itself, stylistically, um, that it's it's um, it's overall the, the the amount of explosive ambition that makes its way into the later episodes from sirens onwards, perhaps, or from cyclops onwards, that, 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 that a new ambition. But the other possibility is that this simply arose from his working on the book, that he was so bubbled in, he was so connected to the book itself, that it wasn't as though these outside events, but it's lovely to feel that the um, cyclops, the episode has men in a pub, but every so often for no reason whatsoever a big parody occurs um about you know contemporary forms of discourse such as for example ancient irish um, translations of texts or the execution of robert emmett and it, it's very tempting to feel that he was thinking about uh, you know that if 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 so much could be destroyed in the Europe that he knew, in the Ireland that he knew, it's surely a book could in some way reflect that. It, it, so the argument could go two ways. One, that it didn't bother him, that he was so involved with, with his plan, so engaged that it didn't bother him. The other one is, I was doing something, um, it's, it's, um, I, it wasn't a word search, a Google search, it was called reading. And I read, uh, I was just reading the book and um, the book is so heavily glossed. Um, you know, you know that there's, there's an annotated Ulysses where really every proper name is there. There's a new version of this now that's a thousand pages long, edited by a man called Sam Sloat, that is just invaluable for anyone now. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna change things. Keep keeping the professors busy for centuries. Yeah, yeah well, that's what Joyce said, right. that his book would do this. But, but, but in the middle of the, of the Robert Emmett, one of, the, one of the problems has been that a lot of the scholars have been Americans, who, who uh, you know, as we know, we have <laughs> nothing against. We accept their hospitality whenever it's offered. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that so many of the jokes are so local, so many of the references are so tiny, um, that um, 
So no allowance for readers outside. No, but right. a lot of Americans have really learned a lot about Ireland from Ulysses, their version. Anyway, um, I'm reading the book and it's, um, this is, this is the Robert Emmett execution and there's a description of the execution and then the name of the person who's in charge of the execution. And it's given as um, Tompkins, Tomlinson, Maxwell, French Mullen. I can't do anything with it. Just he's got an enormously double barreled name. It's four barreled. And uh, it just looks like a, the annotation says it's just a posh uh, parody of a posh English name. Tom, 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 Tompkins, uh, French Mullen or um, Maxwell. And um, of course, um, if you're an Irish reader, especially if you were reading it when I did after the 1916, after the 2016, after the centenary, of course, Maxwell is in is Maxwell. And it's, it's, this is the man who oversaw the execution of Emmett. Sir John Maxwell oversaw the executions of the 1916 leaders. And there is his name inserted. In other words, this is meant to be 1904. This is meant not to know the future. And here it is as a tiny little joke. It's a little anachronism thrown in for fun to throw in Maxwell's name. But um, I, I, I get credit now in the new sound float for having invented this. In other words, no one had noticed it. And in teaching it this semester, we, we had two new things students noticed in the book that no one has ever noticed before. What? Well, I give you, there's a really great example, which is from Sirens, that there's a, um, there's, a, there's a waiter called Pat in the Sirens episode, and Joyce can't stop saying, Pat, the waiter, waited. Pat, waited, the waiter. Bold Pat, the waiter, waited. And he just does this throughout, he just goes, okay, well, he likes saying bold Pat, waiter, waited. And, um, Pat, Pat, and it, it, it's several re references constantly to Pat, Pat, Pat. And then there's a blind piano tuner who has, to, yeah. who has forgotten something, has to come back to the hotel to find what he's looking for. And um, when he's coming, we know he's coming because it just says tap, 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 tap. I mean, you know, you know, with the sound, Joyce became fascinated by sound. Tap, 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 tap. She said, hold on a minute, Pat, tap. The, it's the other th thing spelled spelled the other way around that he was the soundscape of sirens is is so designed yes. that any word has to be you know really carefully examined so pat becomes tap there's the, the the other one is where there's a moment where um bloom links Stephen. so they're the two characters and Stephen's younger than bloom and bloom is sort of looking for him in some funny way all day and the the, the phrase used to describe how he links him is a phrase from the Bible to describe the abomination of homosexuality. And oddly, no one has ever noticed that before. And um, in fact, one of the editors of the new big book, when he when I sent him the information through a through an intermediary, just sent back to damn, <laughs> meaning we hadn't noticed it for the yeah. book, it will go into the second edition, yeah. Yeah. meaning that you can still read yeah. the book as uh, and find odd things in it because it um you know it's it's filled mm. with it's filled with tiny jokes that are Dublin jokes, but it's also filled with so many references, for example, to the history of English prose, or to things in the Bible, or to books Joyce had. I mean, suddenly in the middle of nowhere in the book, I mean, in the long dramatic episodes, which, which is Circe, Stephen suddenly shouts out, no tongue, no tongue, N-O-T-H-U-N-G. Well, that's Wagner, that's the ring, <laughs> out of the blue. Right. And then you can trace that that the ring was performed in Dublin quite a number of times in the years when before Joyce left Dublin and the Joyce's library had libretti had mm -hmm. actually um, books um, a book of essays by Wagner and it was Joyce was studying and paying attention of, of course he was because the ring contains the same idea of overall design of motif of mm -hmm. patterning mm -hmm. who, who, what other artist was working as he was or Wagner was mm -hmm. and of course in Trieste he would have been immensely aware of Wagner mm -hmm. which is I'm just saying that that all you have to do is just read the book and think no time is that an Irish word? No tongue. And you realize, no, it's a sword. And uh, right. it's, it's from the ring. Right. So there's, in other words, there's a constant sense of um, the book as being so filled with um, the, I suppose, the, the way that he could amass information and amass reading and the way in which he wasn't, he can never be taken singly. You can never say a thing about him as the author. That's entirely true. Often the opposite is true, but it needs to be qualified, mm -hmm. which is what I'm saying about his politics, his nationalism, or his, his indeed his devotion simply to his art. Mm -hmm. th th this, this may be, but, but, but he had, uh, uh, you know, the, he, let, he let so much into the book from outside 
I suppose, literary matters. There's so much, I suppose, felt life in the book. Yeah. Um, you mentioned his explosive ambition, and I'm really curious about this because he, as you say, he experiments so much stylistically, formally. Um, so for anyone who hasn't read it, the, the final episode, Penelope, this is Molly Bloom's soliloquy. It's eight extended and unpunctuated sentences. You mentioned uh, Proteus, which is the first time we kind of enter in Stephen's head. This is the attempt to kind of render visual perception of the world on the page. It's quite disorientating for the first time. Um, we can think of Aeolus um, and its use of formal features of print journalism. So headlines interjected into the text and actually to your point about the schema and the, and the organs, um, one of my kind of favorite, um, uh, how, how that maps on to Aeolus is for the, for the world of print journalism, it's, it's, the, it's the lungs. So it's this idea of journalism is very windy. And I've been thinking a lot about that as I read the news recently. Um, <laughs> thinking more about uh, Colm, this idea of his explosive ambition for you as a novelist, and you are, of course, a brilliant novelist in your own right. Imagine many of you are fans of Colm's novels. What are some of the most exciting and most enduring formal experiments in the book? And are there any moments when you feel that Joyce is actually too ambitious and that he cannot pull off what he's trying to achieve or that the form of language just doesn't allow him to do what he's trying to do? Um, I did feel that more than I do. And I found particularly the Circe episode, which is the one which is done in the form of drama. I found it about 50 pages too long. And um, this time round, reading it this year, I found it the most moving of all. Now that's a strange idea. That's something I found, look, look this is what, you know, with episodes you often look ahead, how many more pages is in this episode? It's like a book of short stories you often do that with. But I found that, um, the, I found that it contained the book's unconscious, that each of the characters, especially Bloom and Stephen, you found that the things that, that, that were not, that they were not thinking about, that they were maybe dreaming about, that those dreams were becoming uh, dominant in this chapter in ways that were really rich and alarming and disturbing. You know, that Stephen is trying not to think about his mother. And in this episode, his mother actually comes to him in, in her grave clothes. And similarly, all the things that Bloom has not been thinking about when he's thinking about sex, that his sexual life emerges as a, as a much more, I suppose, um, complicated business. I, I mean, there are moments when, and, and this is a, an interesting thing where, if you're if, if, if you're reading Ulysses now, say as a young person, where all those matters of gender are really so important and, and is open to be discussed, that episode where that moment where Bloom really, really wants to be, you feel his deepest desire is to dress as a woman and to be dominated. And that that's something he's, you can see is not thinking about very carefully in the conscious life of the, you know, of the everyday. But in this episode, it, it's, it's what happens. It's what matters to him. And so I found that episode really haunting this time around. So uh, I think, it's, I think that, that the, the book itself changes as you change and as your own weather changes. And indeed, perhaps even as the weather of debate changes on, for example, the matters such as gender or indeed on matters such as nationalism, mm -hmm. that your own reading of the book could change. Right, right, of course. And, and this actually gets to a question I also had, which is that you know, holding up Ulysses to the present moment, so many of Leopold Bloom's preoccupations about essentially calling for universal basic income at one point, of vegetarianism, of the inner lives of animals. We get insights into bats, cats, of Gary Owen, the dog, um, of supply chains, of, of the question of separating art from the artist. Um, you, you teach this uh, every spring, it seems now, to, to undergraduates. Right. Um, what do you see reflected back, um, I suppose, apart from questions of gender? And what do you feel has, has the book kind of predicted for us? Oh, I, I think one of the um, I, I, we, we, we really have to talk about Oxen of the Sun. Oxen of the Sun is the episode which um, is, a, is a history of English prose. In, in other words, um, he has all these men. Now, why he has these men, I do not know, in a, in a maternity hospital. They've just gathered while a woman called Mrs. Purifoy is trying to have a baby upstairs. These men are just drinking and sitting around and talking. It seems as though, you know, every place is a bar. And, you know, it's, it's I mean, you pass a maternity hospital now thinking, if I tried to go in there, now there's a matron to stop me. But anyway, in Ulysses, this episode, 
um, he, he takes, um, he, for example, the, the early translations from Latin or the emergence of Middle English or the um, or Old English or the Chaucer, and he goes right through um, the great sort of, um, I suppose in his years, the history of English prose with figures like Babington Macaulay and um, were, were sort of studied much more than they are now. We, we, can, we know what books he used to write this episode, but the episode could be impenetrable until you see the joke. Now the joke is interesting because the joke is showing for students of post-colonial um, um, enterprises to see that um, this is what a Irish student knew in these years. In, in other words, that Joyce had a university education you know, he was the first obvious, I mean, he was, he was in a generation where this was becoming possible in Dublin. And what he was learning wasn't, um, you, you know, you know he, was, he, was, he was sort of Caliban being transformed and he had elements of Caliban left in him, but the other elements were so, were so um, delighted by learning that we can see him showing off, just going down the hill with, with no hands on the handlebars. Just saying, This is English prose, I own it. Watch me playing with it. Anthony Burgess thought it was every novelist, everyone interested in English language. That this is the show off chapter. This, this is the one that really shines. But of course, for the reader beginning it, you do need to know at what point one style moves into the other, in which case you can just go to a critical, one of the critics who will tell you. And so that's not hard. And um, but I think there is an element of politics in this where, where he, he isn't, as it were, throwing stones at the empire. He is showing I have freed myself from it using language, the very language that was is meant to have been in, sort of imposed on me from outside is the very one that I'm imposing back that I, I have I have learned to relish Now, learning to relish is probably a more political thing to do for him than to try and write in Irish, that to actually take English and, and become its, its, its um, you know, to become a sort of protagonist in the development of English prose himself, as he did do, is, is probably as political an act as turning away from the language. So writing the national epic, right? Because so there's a, a great moment in, in episode nine, Scylla and Charybdis, where Dr. Sigerson says, our national epic has yet to be written. Yeah, he's writing a, a national epic in English. Yeah, that's a lovely moment where mm. Stephen is there and he really looks like a callow youth. He's a poet. Dublin is so full of them. I used to be one, a poet who hasn't written a poem yet, but will write one soon and is so arrogant about the possibility. And Stephen is there in, and he's, he's pontificating about Hamlet. And yes, there's a reference to the national epic yet to be written. And there's a lovely sense of a, of a sort of um, shadow coming into the room of, of the light changing for a moment. Thinking, actually, it will be written and it will be written, you know, I, I will be the source. And there's a lovely moment where Bloom looks in for a second. He's gone into the National Library because he wants to check um, an advertisement that's been in a local newspaper. So he, he's busy in the library, but he just looks in for one second. And, um, but they don't meet yet, you know. And, uh, they meet later. And when you all read it or reread it, you'll, you'll, you'll read about their meeting. Um, I have two more questions since we've already run out of time as always. Um, uh, the, the penultimate question is, is kind of picking up on this phrase that I keep coming back to when I've been reading it and rereading it. Um, this is a point that Declan Kibbard makes in his introduction. So he writes that the breakdown of the old equation, so this is in the early 20th century, the breakdown of the old equation between the structure of a language and the structure of the known world. So that's kind of in his mind. He writes, in simple terms, the zones of scientific and technical knowledge had expanded massively in the modern period, while the resources of language seemed to lag behind. Such developments as the analytic exploration of the conscious and unconscious had been confronted only belatedly by the makers of literature, and Joyce was one of the first to face the challenge. For you, Colm, I mean, we find ourselves in 2022, um, a kind of structure of the known world, the zones of scientific and technical knowledge have expanded even more. We're in the grips of the internet, of smartphones, we're in the midst of a climate crisis uh, with the promise of migration over the course of the century. As you say, you know, with post-colonialism, we're reckoning with really uncomfortable and traumatic historical narratives. So do you feel that today's resources of language are lagging behind um, these expanded 
zones that, that we find ourselves in in the 21st century. In other words, are we due a 21st century Ulysses? What would that look like? Is it possible in the form of a novel? <laughs> That, that, that I, th I think it's important that um, Dublin in 1904, as viewed from 1914 into 1921, is on the cusp. It's one of the cities that's going to change. And he, he makes it into a, a strange, sometimes no one seems to have any work. Nothing gets manufactured in the city. Um, but actually, uh, there's a, so much talk and so much song. And the novel itself then begins to explore at the very edges of possibility of where consciousness can be rendered in language. And he tries out every trick possible, you know, from working with the very history of the language as though that could give you a sort of narrative energy moving into question and answer. He did the, he did the headlines um, in Aeolus um, much later. This is one of the things he did to, to annoy the printers. He had done the newspaper and was what fun it would be in a time of mass circulation of newspapers that was beginning to actually use headlines in a novel. Um, and make them silly or make them true. So that so he's thinking all the time. And finally, he's thinking, what, what would it be like if a woman spoke uninterrupted in Ireland? <laughs> what would that mean? What would she sound like? And um, so he's, he's working all the time with the idea of words having a sound. And he's fascinated by, you know, pat, tap, pat, tap. But he's also, of course, he's fascinated by print culture. That, that the book is going to be printed and he's uh, advertising is at its core and newspaper is at its core. So he's pushing things as far, I mean, in other words, he's using what he's, he's fascinated by what's going on in the world and trying to make this into the most playful sometimes and serious other times set of tropes in a novel. Um, and, but of course, behind everyone, if you're working in these years, Freud was not, as Auden said, he was not just merely a person. He was a climate of opinion. You know, he was, a, he was in the air so much that that chapter, that episode I was talking about, Circe, where they are in night town, and it, it, it is a question of anything can move into dream at the smallest moment. It isn't as though there's any reality, you know, principle in that episode as much as any time there's anything that seems to be happening in real time, it slips and slides into the unconscious. And it's an exploration of the secret life of the characters. It was always that sense um, in cities. Um, and, and this is true with, say, Joseph Conrad. It's true with Robert Louis Stevens, with Henry James, um, with Oscar Wilde, that people in cities had secret lives. And if you made that into something in a novel, but he, but he made it as though the novel itself had a secret life, which is explored in that episode. The, the, the novels uh, is a way the, the 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 novel itself having an unconscious, but it, but it, but I, th I think the question remains, and it's a question that I think animates the book. To what extent can someone's mind rendered? What extent can thinking self rendered in, in sentences? Mm. So he was pushing it, mm. and um, he was. Um, having a tremendously good time. There's a sense sometimes, you know, he loved the Book of Kells, even though, you know, he loved, he loved the Odyssey, but the Book of Kells done by the monks, the intricate marks made, the, the, the sort of, the, the, the way in which every letter could itself become a sort of work of art, that also intrigued him. So, um, it's, it's, but it's hard to answer that question because, right. because the terms you raised are, so complex um, that I think I'm just too simple-minded really to be able to give you a proper answer to that question. Well, but it's difficult. But it, but it, is, a, but it, it is a great question. It's a difficult one because, you know, you mentioned, I asked about the internet, you, you refer back to the newspaper. We talk about, you know, the multitudinous nature of all, you know, huge numbers of voices, not just the female voice. And it does feel like the scales now are so much bigger. And I, I just don't know that that it would be possible. I mean, maybe there's no answer. Um, the final question, uh, Colm, is that you've spent, um, in the interest of also highlighting your new book, The Magician, which again will be for sale after the event, you spent much of this past year inside the head of a, of a different novelist, that of Thomas Mann, the German writer. He writes um, Budden Brooks in 1901, The Magic Mountain in 1924. Um, these are two uh, major early 20th century writers. To what extent are they comparable? 
where did I mean you've been in the in the mind kind of both of them because you've been writing about the setting of Ulysses you've been writing or I suppose publicizing the magician do you feel that there's overlap do you feel that there are divergences how how do you reconcile them in your head um in um in the late 30s Thomas Mann became really alert to Joyce and he was in America. I can't find that there, 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 often it's very funny trying to work out with someone, even someone you know well, have you actually read Ulysses or do you just know bits of it? With Borges, for example, he, 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 he's one of the first readers of it, but in what he writes about, he makes clear that you can't really read it. So it seems he didn't read it. He just knew about it and loved the idea of it and got, you know, uh, got a lot of energy from it. And um, Th Thomas Mann didn't read it as far as I can work out, but he, but, he, but he read a book about it. And obviously he read Harry Levin's book about it. And he became fascinated by the idea that he too, <laughs> he loved, was interested only in pastiche now. And that his novel, Dr. Faustus, which he will start writing in the forties, is so filled with the pastiche of say lectures on music with, with um, even the very idea of a narrator telling a story is a sort of pastiche in his mind in the book. Um, I, I don't think it is fully pastiche, but he uses a great amount of pastiche in Dr. Faustus. And um, he loves to, in diary entries and letters, he loves to feel that he's, that he's aligned with Joyce. And um, so th that's, that's an interesting connection between the two of them. You know, there was a moment where I almost had a meet. And then I just thought, don't, don't go cheesy, you know, don't do cheesy, like you're not Tom Stoppard and don't go around thinking you are. There's a moment where the mans are coming up from a, a place they really don't like um, where they're staying in what, 1911, and they're staying in, a, in, a, in, a, in Croatia. And they decide to go to Venice, which gives him death in Venice. And um, they, go by, they go by water, they go by sea, but they could easily have gone by train and they could easily have gone off in Trieste, and they could easily have left their luggage for a while and just said, well, let's spend a night exploring Trieste. They could easily have met an Irishman in a bar, and they could easily have discussed, you know, the, num the, the, the number of things that they were interested in, in common, sort of secret sexuality, how far you can push language, how much you can use your family in a novel. Thomas Mann would have a lot to say about that, Buddenbrooks, and certainly how the, the rebuilding of a city, which is Lübeck in Buddenbrooks and Dublin in Dubliners and Ulysses. So the two of them could have had a marvelous conversation or Joyce could have just insulted him for some reason and gone home. So I, I really did think about all the possibilities of this and thought, just don't, don't, please don't do it. Please don't, please don't do this. Thank you, sir. Can we have a big round of applause, please? Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, so we now have about 10, 11, 12 minutes for your questions. Are there any questions in the room? Yes. Thank you for everything you said. I'm very envious of your students. I might even try and tackle it again. Um, and you anticipated my question because I read The Magician. I loved it. <clears throat> 50 years ago, I tried to read Magic Mountain and after three pages, I wanted to cut my head off. And um, and you you said to her, you're very simple. You can't answer the question, but you pick these books to write about and love and these people. What is the attraction? Oh, I, I mean, the beginning of it was where I wrote a novel called The Blackwater Lightship. And it's set in the Irish countryside and it has um, six characters over seven days with a huge amount of recrimination rain outside, the making of tea, saying of rosary, and um, just just general Irishness. Um, and it just wouldn't stop. And it was relentless. And it was um, when it was over the book, I said, I'm not writing that again. I'm not going back. I've done that. I don't want another Irish person near me. Um, and I don't want um, any more rain. And I don't want any more misery. I don't want any more recrimination. I don't want any more Catholics. And um, and so I realized, well, Henry James, you know, in other words, who else? You know, so I wrote The Master almost in retaliation, um, where I found that, you know, that that life, um, you know, it, it wasn't just its glamour that interested me, although that was great, because I could go to Venice instead of going into my own heart, you know, to look at the Irish family. I could go to Venice to research my Henry James novel. But um, so, so in other words, I, I have just done this twice. I've done, you know, I've published 12 
works of fiction, but I've only done that Henry James and the Thomas Mann. I don't have a third coming. And um, in the case of both, you have so much information. With, with James, you have his notebooks, you have his letters, you have um, you know, his sister's letters, his brother's letters, even, even you know, have a biography of his father, you have a biography of his two younger brothers. There's infinite amount of information. And from that, then, if you ever have that, you then have a change of climate in the way he's viewed. With, I think with anyone has left that amount of information. And so over the last 30 years, there has been a complete, I, th I think two new biographies of James, um, a, a lot of critical work on him that has really changed the way we view him, especially his sexuality. Um, it's become much more apparent that the family closed down the archive, really from, I suppose, from 1920 uh, for about 70 years when Heinrich Anderson, the young sculptor, um, James really admired him and um, wrote him 70 very important letters not just important for their um, writing about art, but also just how warm and affectionate and personal they were. And um, he, he asked the family in 1930 for permission to publish these letters. And they said, absolutely not. You cannot publish them. And they weren't published for 70 more years. So, so, so a lot of change occurred, which fascinated me. But also the, just the life of James, the way in which he played with his own preoccupations in, in his novels. So many of the best novels, there is a secret, which is a sexual secret, which if known will be explosive. And there's, there are also whole matters to do with who has money and who doesn't. But with, with Thomas Mann, it, it, it's, uh, um, you know, again, he said after in his will that my diaries are to be published. Um, he, he wrote 35 years and then he crossed it out and wrote 25. But it was actually 20 years after his death, his diaries were published and his diaries were really explosive because they made clear that his secret erotic life was homosexual and also that he was much more uneasy politically than anyone thought he was. And so a whole revision of man's life came, meaning a lot of really good people started to work on that. And I could come in using, you know, I could come in like a magpie, take what I needed and run. And um so that's what I did in the case of both. I found the things that interested me. And I think that if you gave all the information about the Thomas Mann or say Henry James to everybody here, just all the information I had, everyone would write 11 different chapters because your own preoccupations would come to the fore. And it's the same with the Thomas Mann. That, um, and um, so that's where those books come from. They, they come first of all though, from being 19 and reading those novels and um, finding those novels intriguing and taking over my life and I think when you read what you read when you're about 19 or 20 you, you never really recover from and you never read with the same sort of intensity and you don't even know you're doing it when you're 19 which is, it gives it makes it all the more powerful so that's what I was reading then and those books stayed with me and I knew nothing about the authors so it was great being able to read I, you know so um yeah that's how those books came about More questions? Zoom questions? Yes. Who are your favorite poets <laughs> for those on Zoom? Um, how, I mean, you could just start Where at the beginning. Um, the, um, you, know, you know, I wrote a book about Elizabeth Bishop and um, her favorite poet, I suppose, really was George Herbert. And she loved, um, you know the, the the way those Herbert poems are constructed, just 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 the amount of both noticing the world and thinking about the world that could merge in a George Herbert poem. Um, I was um, again, uh, this is about being eighteen rather than nineteen, which maybe you're even more susceptible. Um, I attended a course given by Dennis Donahue, who was a great critic of poetry on a thing called the short, it was called, he, and he had a very posh voice, the short poem in the 16th century. And, you know, I just thought it was a lovely idea, the short poem in the 16th century. And he took us through poems that I didn't know and have stayed with me, such as Sir Thomas Wyatt. You know, they flee from me that sometime did me seek. And a poet that still hasn't become popular, uh, um, Folk Greville, <laughs> Lord Brooke, and uh, you see, and um, 
you know, these, these, were, these were poets that didn't publish often in their lifetimes. They showed their poems to each other. Um, and um, th they were there at the flowering, which is something Joyce would have been very interested in, in the, very the, the first flowering of, of, of English as a literary language. And they were taking so much from Italy as much as they wanted. For example, the formation of the sonnet. So it starts there. Then you find that there are poets in the 20th century who really took this up, one of them being Tom Gunn. And in the Bishop book, I have a sort of chapter on Elizabeth Bishop's relationship to Tom Gunn, who was, um, he, he, was uh, he, he was in Cambridge when F. Or Leavis was really at the height of his work, where the whole idea of um, the poem or the novel having a moral content and dealing with life in some way, you know, you know that, you, that you don't write a poem about your dreams, you write a poem about something that's real and that's true, and that, and that it forces you to confront things and say things about life that are, that are true. And um, he went on to Stanford, where he studied with another great moralist um, critic, was Ivor Winters. And um, he ended up being a sort of 16th century poet um, um, in the 20th century and an Englishman in California. And he loosened up his study, he began to take drugs. He loved drugs. And he loved from being that sort of the tight, his stanzas are so tightly constructed. And then he becomes a sort of a Californian poet and lets it all hang out. <laughs> And then when the AIDS crisis occurs, he begins to write these great elegies. And again, they're written in rhyme and they're written in stanzas. So, I mean, I, mean, I could go on forever because obviously um, <laughs> I've just published my first book of poetry and I'm going to be 67 on Monday. And um, you know, to, get, to get through your life in Dublin without publishing a book of poetry has been, you know, there are a lot of poets. And to be a bad poet in Ireland is particularly it's really, I suppose, it's like being a bad capitalist in America or something that you that you um, that you really um, would be despised. You know, in other words, people would say, "Who's the worst poet in Ireland?" And they would often mention quite a quite a good poet, but not good enough. She or he is the worst. Usually, he he is the worst poet in Ireland. And people love having those strong opinions about poetry. I think the same thing happened in Poland. Often they happen in countries where there really isn't a lot of, uh, of um, money knocking around and there's quite a lot of bad weather and in no money, bad weather uh, and a lot of dandruff, uh, you know, uh, early, early dandruff and um, a lot of young men sitting around, um, you know, usually with one woman allowed into the company, Simborska in the case of Poland and uh, people like Ivan Boland, Eleni Nikola in Ireland. But, you know, people, a lot of people ate and drank poetry, had favorite, and people would say the best poet in Ireland, and they'd love saying someone who really wasn't the best poet in Ireland. You know, the, the, you know it became a way of just, um, I suppose, it became a metaphor for life, really, that, you know, the, if you were a contrary person, you took it out on poets. And, um, so in this world, I was alive when Seamus Heaney's North came out, and I was at the first reading of it. I was there when Ivan Boland's books were coming out. I was, I was there when Derek Mann's The Snow Party came out. I was there when, I've, I've, I've experienced Samistat because Philip Larkin published um, Obad, not in a volume of poetry, but in, a, in, a, in the TLS, which I didn't have access to. Someone copied it out for me in longhand and gave it to me. And I did that in turn, like an ancient Irish monk, copying out this poem, this great poem by Larkin, which all of us knew would be there forever, you know, would be what's canonical the day it appeared, but I didn't have access to it. And so um, this is, you know, pre-internet, but also where, you know, the TLS was not something, I was in Dublin and it just wasn't there. And uh, so certainly Larkin's poems made an enormous difference. And then all, I, I could go on, and I, but I would like to mention Wallace Stevens just at the, at the end as being, you know, that those, the, the gorgeousness of that style gave me a way of looking at America, which um, has been very helpful. You know, in other words, that America comes in many guises. And one of them is the sort of gorgeousness of this insurance guy in Hartford, Connecticut, who saw the world in, 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 in with, with, um, that was an extraordinary sense that anything can be imagined and reseen and re-envisioned and recreated. Um, he, even the most, you know, he loved the word quotidian almost so that he could destroy it, so he could ruin the quotidianness of the quotidian. 
if you'll excuse me saying something so ridiculous. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. From a fellow Irish person. And so it's going to be an Irish question. Are you excited about contemporary Irish literature and the new generation of Irish authors uh, and poets? I remember um, years ago um, with um, Alice's father was uh, when he was um, running favor, John McGahern, the Irish novelist, was in London and um, McGahern had a very good sense of humor. So you have to remember this was a joke. But it was a very good one where he said, I hear there are a lot of young Irish writers starting up. And uh, Robert McCormick, yeah, yeah. I'm trusting you now to stamp all this out. <laughs> and uh, what's happening now is that um, every season, um, there are two or three first books coming that look like the beginning of an extraordinary career. Recently with Louise Kennedy with um, a novel called Trespasses that you just look at that and think, how, like, what is she going to do now? What's going to happen next? It's been true in also in nonfiction with, um, say, Dirin Grifo with The Ghost in the Throat, with a whole new way of looking at um, writing autobiography, say. And um, Anna Burns with, you know, Milkman. Um, I mean, there's so many books. I mean, I'm just mentioning a few, but with even with recently with the publication of Claire Keegan's book. Um, and that that book you realize has, has sort of uh, has, it's entered into the it's entered into the consciousness of the society o over Christmas. It was the it was it was more important than a lot of other things at Christmas. That little book, and um, so I mean, and, and and the same thing is happening in poetry. I, I, I did a reading. I'm, you see, I'm a poet now, so I can do readings, and I, you know I'm going to get a leather jacket and I'm going to get attitude, you know. But um, I was reading the other night with a young poet from Belfast called Porig Regan, and um, the first book out with Cark in it. And they are so well made, these poems. Every phrase has been studied. And Porig is part of a movement in Belfast. I mean, a movement is a funny word, but he's a part of a group of poets who have studied with Kieran Carson in Belfast that are now producing their first and second books. And that's very exciting what's happening in poetry in Belfast. Um, so, yeah, it's. Um, it's 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 a it's a very exciting time, um, except that I'm just too old. It's what it's what uh, Yates. It's what Joyce said to Yates. I could help you, but you're too old. 